Gestalt language processing, AAC, ethics. We are getting into it in a future course here at ABA Speech. Did you know that at www.abaspeech.org, I list all of our upcoming CEU courses. Every single month, I do a live course, either myself or a speaker, and the next coming months for our back to school, I said it, back to school time, we're going to be talking about the ethics of collaboration around the ideas of Gestalt language processing, AAC, verbal imitation. In September, we're going to be talking about naturalistic interventions. We have so many wonderful things in store. Now, these CEUs, you can register for the webinars completely free, and that is going to be a link in the show notes. So make sure that you register. If you want to purchase a general certificate, that's $5. Members of the ABA Speech Connection membership, are you in the membership yet? If not, join us. There's over 300 professionals and parents in the membership. You get your CEUs completely free as part of your membership. But if you're like, hey, Rose, I'm not ready for the membership. That is okay too, because every single month you have the option to just pay for your single CEU. These are ASHA approved and ACE approved courses for BCBAs, professionals, and anybody who wants to attend. So make sure that you check the notes in the show notes that is going to have the link that will take you to register for our upcoming live events around the ideas of ethics, collaboration, Gestalt language processing, AAC, naturalistic interventions, and so much more. I cannot wait to see you on a future live course. How can we help people achieve their potential? And how do we know we are getting a good outcome. Those are just a couple of the topics that I discussed today on the podcast with Dr. Rick Kubina. Dr. Rick Kubina is a PhD, BCBAD, and he is Central Reach's Director of Research and a Professor of Special Education at the Pennsylvania State University. I learned about Rick and his work at the OHABA conference. He talked all about data in such a very eloquent way. We know that data is very, very important, and it allows us to know, are we making important decisions? Is there a good outcome? We talk about the state of the field, how much it's grown. We get into a lot of great topics. I'm excited for you to listen to this conversation with Dr. Rick Kabina. You're listening to Autism Outreach Podcast, a podcast full of ready-to-use strategies to help those with autism strengthen their communication skills. Here's your host, Rose Griffin of ABA Speech a speech therapist and board-certified behavior analyst who shares tips you can use in your next therapy session. Welcome to the Autism Outreach Podcast. We have a wonderful guest for us today. We have Dr. Rick Kabina with us. Thank you so much, Rick, for coming on to the show. Thank you for having me. And I actually... You came into my orbit. I mean, I think everybody knows who you are in the field of ABA, but I actually heard you speak in person at Ohaba. I think it was February 2020, if yes. I, memory serves me correct. And that conference has grown so much. And I remember you did. I'm always really impressed by people who speak in public because that was something that was really hard for me for a while. But now I've I had to dine some mindset work and I've gotten over it. Okay. So I'm going to the front of the room as, as Dr. Pat Fryman says. Um, but you talked about data and, and as an SLP and BCBA, that's one of my favorite topics. But, and I know you go really deep on topics, but the topic you covered was really, it was nice. It was like a great topic. It was about data. I thought it was really relatable and I'm nerdy. So I was like, this guy is making data seem really exciting and fun. And like, we can all do it. So thank you for your public speaking skills, because anytime you can get up in front of a group of 500 people and feel like you're connecting with everybody in the audience, I think that is just, that is a really big skill that I think is hard for a lot of people. Well, thank you for that. I I will tell you a little secret. I've worked on it. (laughs) I have been to, uh, in the past, there are, uh, actual people that will coach you and there are these exclusive workshops you can go to that help you become a better presenter. And I thought, you know what? You just got to keep learning through life. Yeah. And I 
attended some of those and I started reading about it and I practiced it and I really try hard to be the best presenter that I can. And I still mess up, but I think if you do more good things, Mm -hmm. people remember the good things versus if you have a couple slip ups, they don't remember those. You remember them. (laughs) <laughs> yes, that's good. Actually, I did a speak. I was in a speaking mastermind two years ago with uh, Mike Pacione. I have some business mentors. And so Mike Pacione has coached, you know, athletes and NFL players and, you know, people that do TEDx talks. And it was a very intense watching TED talks, practicing, workshopping. I was having people listen to my talks about like joint attention and autism that had millions of views on TED talks on YouTube. And, and, you know, that's kind of like a mind wrap to get around that one. But I, you know, it gave me a framework and made me feel comfortable. And then I really love Dr. Pat Fryman has this um, article that I think is is like 15 tips for public speaking yes. like, and talking about going to the front of the room. And I, you know, I just love being at the front of the room kind of in my mind, but now I'm good with it. But I think once you get like a framework and you workshop it and you get, I'm sure when you present, you have you know, I like to have my presenter notes. I do my slide deck a certain way. I have to have a clicker. I have to have a handheld mic. I'm like very neurotic about those things. But I think once you get a framework, then you feel more comfortable, right? Once you kind of work on it and things. Absolutely true. And I know the article that you're talking about, I've shared that in the past with my doctoral students. And if you've listened to Pat Fryman talk before, he embodies everything that he (laughs) says in there. Probably uh, the top presenter in our field. Oh, he is. It's amazing. Yeah. And I think just the stories he tells and he's, yeah, he's amazing. Um, So tell us a little bit. I was kind of, I obviously know who you are. You're very, a big player in the ABA field, but for those of us that are not as familiar with you work, can you just tell us how you, you know, how you got into the field? I always love hearing people's stories on that. Sure. Well, this, this dates myself, but back in the mid eighties is when I started my journey in psychology and I was just lucky enough to run into a professor that was doing some things that at the time were intriguing to me. But little did I know that this guy that I was studying was very big in, in this field. Like you just, it's, it's luck. Mm-hmm. And it was pure, pure luck. I followed up on that. Uh, in psychology degree is preparatory. And you're not going to do much with a, with a mm-hmm. degree. So he's like, oh, you got to go to uh, Ohio State. And uh, I'm like, okay. And he's like, you got to study with this guy, John Cooper. John Cooper is one of the authors, Cooper, Heron, and Heward, of this book that we uh, affectionately call the White Book, <laughs> Cooper Text, although there's two other authors. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my life just went from there. I did my master's degree with, uh, with Coop. And then uh, I came back and I worked with, you know, all of those authors that are on that book. Wow. They, are, they turned out to be my committee members. And oh, it was wow. just really very fortunate for me to just be in the right, you know, right, right space, right time, just with just luck. That's amazing. Actually, Dr. Heward, um, I presented at Ohaba not last year, the year before. And we did a talk. I had two other duly certified people. We did an ethics talk about SLP BCBA collaboration, which it's like, you're like, are there 400 people in this room because they need this ethics CEO or is it because they want to see me? But regardless, ethics always packs a room. You know what I'm saying? I actually teach the class here at Kent State. There's like an online, you know, course. I've been teaching it for six years, this semester actually. Um, but I was getting ready and um, he was speaking in front of me and then he actually stayed. He He's so cool to meet at conferences and I have his book. I actually, about the behavior contracts, I have three kids. Yes. Like we have behavior contracts for all the kids. I told my husband I was going to put him on one too, but um, you know, <laughs> everything, they're all signed, started the school year, but but he, you know, was active student engagement, participating in my talk. And um, it was so cool. Like, it's it's just neat that those you worked so closely with those people. And he's he's so cool at a conference because he he goes to sessions. He's taking notes. He's yes. engaged in learning. And, you know, when I first started presenting at conferences, I really started trying to do more in-person talks about a year ago. I would just be like so nervous that I would be like, just kind of like resting until it was my time to present. But now, you know, now I'm in a groove. So now I'm mixing meeting people and things like that and learning going to other sessions. Sometimes I was like, Oh, no, what if I go to the session? It's so great. And then I have to get up and I'm like, Hello, you know, what I mean? so but I, I've kind of got over that. But if you ever go to a conference, I think that's what's nice about ABA conferences is that you see the most important people. Like I remember I met Mark Sunberg, Dr. Mark Sunberg at like 
the hotel bar because I was with yes. uh, Mary Barbera, who I know is a friend of yours. She's a friend of mine. And um, it's just funny. They're smaller. Speech therapy conferences are um, are just larger. But I think that's going to change because the field is really growing. So um, which kind of leads into my next question, which I love talking to. Um, I've been doing some work with BDS, so Dr. Stephen Eversall, um, and talking to him about um, conferences, like when he was in the field, like I think he was at a conference and Skinner was there and just, you know, interesting things that are, the field has changed so much um, just in the time that I've been certified, which is about 12 years. So what what do you think, like, how have you seen the field change since you've started in the field? Yeah, well, that's that's a deep question. (laughs) My very first conference was 1993. And when I went to that conference, it was in Chicago. I'll still remember it to this day. There was a talk on shaping and uh, Karen Fryer, who your audience members might not know, but she's like the most famous animal trainer that's out there, Mm -hmm. uh, was with Ogden Lindsley, who's the Mm -hmm. founder of Precision Teaching. Uh, Oh, uh, there was another very famous animal person. At any rate, um, and, and there was one other person I'm sitting there. And I'm listening to these folks. This is like the first talk I go to. And they're just talking about all these things. I look back now and I wish I would have videoed it because (laughs) it is was the most profound talk with the most profound people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're talking about these things that they learned out of the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. That generation of my age, I was able to listen to them, to interface Mm -hmm. with them. Now, you know, I mean, this is how it's true just through humanity, Mm -hmm. wherever you are, wherever you find yourself in terms of age, there's going to be a time where you have that. Like your folks might be like, for me, those folks back then are going to be the folks now where you're going to hear like Mark Sundberg and these other people (laughs) who, and and it's always going to be like that because you just, you know, time keeps moving forward. People are young at one point, next thing you know that they're old and and they pass. And then I mean that's just the cycle of life. And I become very reflective on that the older that I have become. And when I think about the field and how it's changed, you know, it's very easy uh, to fall into that, you know, old man on the yard shaking his <laughs> fists at the world, like this isn't how we did things. And, right. and that's going to always be true. And mm-hmm. what I have found personally is to take what has worked from that time and figure out. How can you plug it in? How can you make that accessible? And and how can you share that with the current group? And and some of the things that were done back then, you know, a lot of people also are very idealistic, and you, know, you you have this certain romanticism or nostalgia about the old times. Well, the old times weren't. You know, you're looking at those at the positives, and you're not looking at the things that weren't so negative. So there's a lot of things where the field is changing for the better. Uh, and some of the things were changing uh, for not so so good. And uh, I suppose if you wanted specifics, I could talk about some of the specifics. But just generally speaking, my take on where the field was back then, you know, the way the, the emphasis on analysis was more back then, whereas now uh, that and that that is not taught as much as, mm-hmm. as it was back then. But now. Yeah. There's a huge push on compassionate care. And right. while there were, you know, people would talk about that, there was nowhere near the push on that back and then. So so there's a lot that has changed. And uh, I, I think the field is evolving and it's getting better. And let me say this to your audience. Uh, there were very few SLPs back in the day who were interested in behavior analysis. Mm-hmm. Now there are many SLPs. And in fact, I have some very dear friends who are SLPs who are talking about evidence-based SL. You know, there's all these things too that have just made SLPs more aligned with some of the things. Again, there's there's differences in, in how you're trained and taught, mm-hmm. but that's okay. So, so lots of differences and in, in very good changes. Yeah, yeah. I think the yeah the idea about compassionate care. I had Dr. Cody Morris on my podcast. I think last year he's awesome, and he I just talked about his article at a recent conference about ascent. There were other authors on that article too, and it, what was interesting about that article they wrote about ascent was he talked about how we have been talking about this in our field for quite a while. And he just brought up some like really old school articles that I used to have my ethics students read. Um, 
Um, one about like people's rights to eat too many donuts and take a nap. Like I can't remember the exact article, but you know what I'm saying? Like, why are we holding our clients to a higher standard than like we would? Like, you know, sometimes if I'm working home on a Friday, I'm exhausted. I might like do some emails from bed, you know, because I can, right? Like, why are we like doing that? So yeah, I think that that is interesting. I do understand like, um, well, I was talking to Matt Sicoria last week and um, we're working on a project together. And he said something that I thought was really interesting. He said, uh, you know, when did ABA become a four letter word? So, you know, as being a speech therapist and a BCBA, I've been practicing over 20 years and I've been duly certified 12. And when I first started at doing both, it was like, people were just unfamiliar with ABA is what it kind of seemed. And they were like, I don't know what a mand is. And I don't know what a tact is. And, you know, it was kind of like that, you know, we're supposed to use understandable language. We're ethically called to do that. Right. Um, but now it's so adversarial. Like when I first started my podcast, we're almost on episode 200. I, I had on a lot of like, we'll call them influencers in the SLP space. Um, I, I was invited to speak at the most, uh, the biggest things in the whole SLP world, invited presentations online, virtually in person. And then as this shift has changed with like the neurodiversity movement, which I think there's some good things coming out of that and Gestalt language processing and all this. I just like two years ago, I was talking to one of my business coaches and I was like, he was like, you just have to lean into ABA, you know, and this has to be like your, your whole personality. You can't just be like, you know, it's part of you. So, so really now in the podcast, I mostly have BCBAs. I'll have people from my membership that are SLPs, but are behaviorally oriented. Um, so it's nice that you you have some colleagues that are SLPs in real life that um, are on board with ABA, because if you ever spend any time online, which you probably are not on Instagram, like I am, but it's very, very us versus them. So that is really sad, you know, for the field. Yeah, that, yeah. that, unfortunately is a byproduct of uh, social media in general. It's yeah. not just in our fields. That's just society. Yeah. Uh, maybe the Democrats versus the Republicans yeah. here, here in the States. That's, that's the, you know, you're this religious group versus that religious group. You're, yeah. you know, and, and it gets so niche, like the, the, the more niche you are. So, and, and uh, what people in the media have found, and this is true, what they found just in general is if you can evoke outrage, that will evoke people's attention. And we live in the attention economy where mm -hmm. if you can get attention, then great. And people will just say provocative, outrageous comments because it's going to piss somebody off. And then yeah. we'll respond. And, but that garners attention. It garners likes. And, and that's what people do. And that's it's unfortunate because you know the civility and – you know, uh, the, the, the opportunity to have authentic conversations, oftentimes that's lost in, once you go into this campism. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very hard for somebody that I am putting myself on it. Although I do think LinkedIn, I have like LinkedIn is social media. It is more professional, is. but I always, every time I speak at an ABA conference, I'm like, and if you're not on LinkedIn, you should be on there because that's where I've met like all these amazing BCBAs. So it is, it is nice. Um, so what advice would you have for professionals who are new to the field? I would tell people to figure out, and this gets back to how you introduce me, figure out how to be the best at collecting data. And th that might seem simple, but it's actually a very complex process. Mm -hmm. And when you collect data, there are ways you can do it that are not so effective in ways that are very effective. And what I mean by that, how do you, how do you measure effectiveness? it all comes down to decision-making. If you're in an applied position, if everything you do is about making good decisions, you know, outcomes occur in life and there are, there's things that we call luck. And when I talk about luck, all luck means is circumstances beyond our control. And if something happens that is not good, we call that bad luck. If something that happens that is good, we call that good luck. You just can't control that. What you can control is the goodness, the quality of the decisions you make. Mm -hmm. And no matter who you are, if you're in an applied role, you want to make good decisions. And those decisions are going to be manifold. You will make decisions all the time, 
Should you continue that program? Should you switch that program? You know, that's a bigger decision. Mm-hmm. But when you're in the chair at the moment uh, or you're sitting on the floor, whatever you're doing, uh, how well did this work with this particular uh, student or client or wherever you find yourself? And you'll make decisions about that. And being able to make quality decisions is going to take you very far. Now, there is no system that's going to give you perfect decision making because that's not the world we live in. And as I said, luck is always going to occur. And some people confuse the luck that occurs with them being good decision makers. Uh, There's a woman named Annie Duke who used to be a, a poker player, and she wrote this incredible book on decision making. And she uses this term called resulting. And I love this term because resulting means that, you know, things have happened in your life uh, and, and things have been positive and you tend to attribute that to your decisions. But if you looked at that process very closely, it wasn't your decision. It was these other outcomes that just happened. And you can fool yourself into thinking you are a really good decision maker. And if, if, if this is the, the outcome of this resulting, that's something that you need to, to pay attention to. So being able to do really good with decisions, to make good decisions, to collect data, that will be something that you can take for your entire career. And there's always things that you can be better at professionally and within your field. But if you can take and collect data really well and make good decisions, that's going to help you filter out these things that aren't good, that you, know, you go to a, a, a presentation, you listen to a very eloquent speaker, and you're like, yes, you listen to that speaker, you want to do what they're doing because they're charming, they have this really great PowerPoint, but in the end, you know, they're, they're sharing something that it's just not that good. And there are many people like that. And people are going to come across that. You would never know that if you don't have a mechanism that's going to allow you to filter that. And what is that mechanism? It's data collection, which leads us to decision making. Yeah, I love that. That's a great idea. I know I, I did a talk like I think it was last year for a group of SLPs and BCBAs public school. And one of the questions they asked me was how often they should take data. (laughs) And I was like, every single time I sit down with a client, I'm still a treating clinician two days a week. I take data. Like even if I forgot like the main data sheet or like let's say I'm in a different part of the building, right? With a student, like I'm still taking data because I think it's that idea of like, we don't know where we're going if we don't know where we're at. Like those things that are so basic is like collecting baseline including that in the IEP present levels. I'm school-based two days a week. So I think some of those things, and the the district I used to work in was really affluent. So, and we had a lot of non-public programs that I actually worked at as well um, in there. So people would try to like move into this district to try to catapult into like a non-public program. And we would be like, no, 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 no. I'm the speech therapist over at the non-public program. Like this is like our district had four speech therapists, two were SLP BCBAs, and there were only 12 in our state of Ohio. So, you know, it was really, it was really great. I remember one time my data got subpoenaed and I was just like, I was not nervous. I was like kicking my feet up. I was like, go for it. This is a tutorial in how you take data. Do you know what I mean? This is a visual analysis. I would have people graphing like data. This is unheard of in the speech therapy world. You know what I mean? And now we know it's all, you know, we can do these things electronically. But back in the day, we had data binders and all the things. Because if we don't, it's like, well, what did you work on? Or you see a progress note. It's like, is able to label functional vocabulary with 75% accuracy. It's like, well, what were the labels and what are you talking about? You know what I mean? So there's a lot of like, there's a lot of growth in the data field. So I think you like, I try to like be sugarcoated a little bit and say like, how often are you taking data? And you should probably do it more and then be specific about your reporting, you know, because I think that's so important when you get a progress note and you can see exactly what a student's been working on, because otherwise you don't really it's like, what are we doing, right, in the sessions? We don't know how to make those those decisions, like you're saying, about IEP goals or progress notes or next next things that we're working on. So um, I love that. Thanks for sharing that. Um, the field has really grown, you know, rapidly. And I know you've seen it, too, because you've been in the field longer than me. Um, I know when I went to the OHABA conference a really long time ago, one of the first times, it was like one room at 
like a, a college and there were like 200 people there. <laughs> and then, you know, now I've been back, there's breakout sessions. We're getting some of the best speakers, you know, that there are in the field. Um, so it's really grown rapidly. What do you think we need to focus on to make sure that we're providing this high level of care to clients? That's a, that, that's again, a, a really good question. How do you know, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, yeah. but how do you know that anything works? Well, you have some outcome. What is that outcome? That mm-hmm. outcome has to be quantified in some way. And uh, it's not always easy to figure out what does that outcome look like? I, at this point in my career, I have had uh, the good fortune to uh, spend some time consulting with very large payers. Mm-hmm. And at that level, you know, we're talking about these companies that are multi-billion dollar companies. Mm-hmm. And, you know, their their clients are across, you know, 30 states. Mm-hmm. And they struggle with the same issues that people in the field struggle with. And that is, how do you understand if you're getting a good outcome? And, you know, from again, from their perspective, they are the payers. They want to know. Uh, why is it that this, you know, this group of professionals over here always have their hand out and they're always saying, you know, uh, they want the full hours every, and and they're not showing and the progress. And, and again, when you actually start talking with people, like corporations are like any large institutions, you get a bunch of people And within that group, you meet some really good people. You meet some dedicated people, some people that very much want to support what that the mission of of that entity is. Now, it doesn't always work out that way. You know, some of these corporations will do things where, you know, they're slashing costs and and they'll do some sketchy things. And as Mm -hmm. a result, people rightly will conclude that this organization is just about the bottom line. Mm -hmm. But when you talk with folks in there, There are uh, some organizations are really trying hard uh, to make sure that doesn't happen. So it gets down to this idea of outcomes and how do you measure those outcomes? How do you share those outcomes? And Mm -hmm. as a field, how can we all come together and standardize those outcomes? And that's that's a big problem in ABA. It's a big problem in SLP or in speech and language pathology, occupational therapy, physical therapy, psychology, social work. Uh, you have many people doing things, but in terms of standardizing what those outcomes are, uh, it's just not there. So that's something that needs to happen so that the field can move forward. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, so tell us about central reach and the work you do as the director of, of, of research. I know about central reach just because every once in a while I have to put a note in there, but I don't really use, use it a lot. I was on the website. I was like, Oh, this is a, this is a whole thing. Um, but everybody in the field, I feel like is using central reach. Um, but can you just tell us for people that like speech therapists may not know about it, right? Unless they're working in sure. an APA setting. I'm not sure, um, if you guys have a presence there, but tell us a little bit about central reach, uh, and the work that you do as the director of research. Uh, I have been so fortunate to be affiliated with Central Reach. Uh, Fun fact, we were the very first, and by we, my colleague and I created a a data decision-making software uh, program. It was called Chartlytics. We were acquired by Central Reach back in 2018. We were the very first acquisition of that company. And I've been, my and my colleague, we've been with uh, Central Reach ever since. In Central Reach, is a is a suite of software that's geared for the autism IDD space, and mm-hmm. there are many different uh, software offerings that are available in there. And what I'm so excited about, and one thing that that I'm where I've shifted is I've been doing research with AI, and mm-hmm. there the, the company is looking at how can we embrace AI. Mm-hmm. So that it's incredibly helpful and empowers the people that are using the product. Mm-hmm. Uh, anytime you have a business, a business is only su- going to succeed is if it's making money. However, that doesn't mean uh, that you know there's no morality in this and there's no goodwill to this. And this is a company that has a very explicit purpose, which is to help people achieve their potential. 
And mm-hmm. I love that about the company. And I love the fact that it's a business that is you know, continually expanding and creating these different products that help that augment people, that don't replace people. And, mm-hmm. and that's what I'm doing with AI is I'm looking at how can AI augment what therapists, behavior analysts are doing, and it's not meant to replace them. There's a lot of fear out there with mm-hmm. AI that AI is going to take their jobs. And in some, some instances, that could be true. But mm-hmm. in many other instances, especially in healthcare, uh, I, I don't believe that that's going to be true. And in fact, you see where it's going in healthcare, and many people in healthcare, they're, they're embracing AI to the fullest. And uh, I see many analogies to what's happening in, in ABA. And I feel that with this research I'm doing, it's going to help allay people's fears at the same time, show them this is the promise of what AI can do. And here's one more thing I'll say about that. AI is not going away. You can uh, put your head underneath the covers and hope that it goes away, but it's not going away. And people, you're going to be competing against people that are going to be using AI products and you just won't be able to compete with them anymore. And I feel, again, I'm very fortunate to be in this position where I can contribute and help move us down this path where, again, AI is augmenting us, not replacing us. Yeah, that's interesting. I'll be interested to see um, what you're working on. I I just know from like a small business owner's perspective, I went to a conference. It was here in Cleveland for content creators. And um, there was a lot of presentations on AI and some of them are I'm already using. Like I definitely am on chat GPT and all the things, but um, I use this other thing for my podcast called Opus and it's AI. And so after my podcast manager posts are uh, stuff on YouTube, then my assistant takes that link, puts it into this AI generator, and then it breaks it into 10 little clips. Now, one or two are going to be good, but I mean, that saves me so much time. Thanks. And it has captions, and yep. it's like exactly correctly what I'd want to share. And it's just unbelievable. Like, and I think you're right. It's like we obviously, AI is here. We need to feel comfortable using it. And the people that are really going to excel are the people that understand the power of AI and how they can use it to move the needle in whatever, you know, whatever they're doing, because it's applicable for so many different things, you know? So, um, oh, interesting. Okay. I love that. I'm excited about that. Uh, Well, thank you so much for coming on to the show. It was just amazing to speak to you. And um, this was very fun. Where can people find out more about you and your work? Well, uh, I would say the best place to follow me is on LinkedIn. Uh, I I have an Instagram account, but <laughs> I'm very weak in terms of my presentation. Uh, I'm, I also, you know, I, I do some things with Facebook, but honestly, I have like 200 people that it requests to be my friend. I just am not on that hardly at all. Yeah. I don't even pay attention to it anymore. So, <laughs> Uh, and it's kind of sad because I'm like in, so involved in these other things. And you know, even with, with some of these social media things, uh, you know, it, they are what you make of them. Yeah. And uh, l- l- hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, I would love to support any of your listeners that have further questions. That's probably the best place to to link with me professionally. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming on to the show. It was great to connect. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Autism Outreach. If you enjoyed the show today, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode full of actionable strategies you can use in your therapy room. Write a review too. That would mean so much to me. I always love hearing from you. Have a specific topic that you want included on a future show? Reach out over on Instagram, ABA Speech by Rose, or visit me at www.abaspeech.org.